And as Tamron takes the stage and joins us, I'll, I'll first just say um, that she really needs no introduction. I know many of us have followed your career uh, as an award-winning journalist, the host of Deadline Crime with Tamron Hall on Investigation Discovery, currently in its fifth season, which takes an in-depth look <laughs> at crimes that shock, that shock the nation. Uh, but Tamron also was a part of NBC, the NBC News team, co-host of NBC News Today, and uh, is the anchor of MSNBC Live with Tamron Hall. Is that right? I was. Getting right? <laughs> <laughs> Google it. Google it. Um, but, but more than all of that, uh, she is truly a philanthropist. Uh, she's done so much work in the community, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but she focuses her time on homelessness, illiteracy, and the fight against domestic abuse, a topic and subject that I know is very near and dear to you. Uh, so we'll uncover all of those things. But first, I just want to say welcome. Thank you. Um, I am going to first just begin by saying that um, for so many of us, I think I can say in the audience, we have just been so inspired oh. by your work, you. by your journey. You've done it with grace, integrity, and style. So first, I just want to take a moment to just salute you and all of the fabulousness that you bring <laughs> to television each day. So wow. let's give her another round of applause. Thank you, Thank you very much. So I always... I wrote that really well for you. To no, no, you she it. didn't pay me to do this. Delivered it like an Oscar winner. Thank you. Thank you. But I mean it. Um, and, and I really do. And I think it's uh, not often that we see someone um, that just does what you do so well and so gracefully. So thank you so much. Well, it's, I have to be honest, it's not by design or plan. I wish I could say that, you know, I had some life script to work <laughs> off of. People used to ask me all the time, you know, what's next? And... I recently started answering that question by saying, in my early part of my career, I've been on TV since I was 18, I'm now 46, in a few days I'll be 47, and I never truly stopped to smell the roses because I was always looking for the next garden. And so when I got my first TV job at 18, I was like, whoa, $12,000, I gotta get 24. Okay, 24, I gotta get 48. And so I was always looking for the what's next. Mm -hmm. And I. When I look back at the early part of my career, I can quickly tell you this embarrassingly, I was going through some old pictures the other day, and I'm really close to Harry Belafonte now in this version of my life. Well, I met him, mm -hmm. you know, like 25 years ago, and I found the photo just in a box. And I thought, well, I don't even remember that moment. I remember I met him, but all the context of it. And that's because it was what's next, what's new, what's now, what's next. Mm -hmm. And so for me now, I really, at the old age of 46, it's like I'm stopping to smell the flowers in the garden and individually what they mean for my life. So, you know, if there's any grace or class, it's all my family and how I was raised and a recognition that no matter where you are in your life, whatever economic scale, wherever you live, gender, race, we all owe it to ourselves ultimately mm -hmm. to stop and smell the roses. You don't have to savor it too long because we're competitive and we're in a competitive environment. But just that beat, I think, is necessary, and that's what's helped me at this point in my rebirth of my career. I think for so many of us as Googlers in just the busy time in our lives, we don't do that enough. Yeah. And I, was, I did it. Be, I was rushing before there was Google. I mean, you know, right. I mean, it's like you guys have a whole new set of problems. I was 18. There was no Google, and I still felt the rush of it all and all of these things. So, yeah, it's even more pressure now it's just, it's exciting and technology when people you know of course they shrug off oh i don't even use this or that i'm like oh and where's your brick phone and your pager i mean <laughs> i'm a tech person not, not to the degree that obviously many of you are but embracing the fast pace but not letting it control and rule you i mean here you are having a beautiful baby in a few weeks one of the things that i've been very open about is that i feel like i put my career first in every aspect and then i woke up and i'm like oh I'm 46 and I'd love to be a mom. Mm -hmm. And you have that conflict over, was I supposed to you know, pause or what was I supposed to do? And so if I'm being honest with you and I will try to always be that, um, that's been a very difficult road. I see beautiful moms like yourself and I think, wow, when I was 40, I missed this opportunity. I had other great opportunities, but not that of being a mother. But this career, this show, my work with young women, it's given me a different opportunity mm -hmm. that I may not actually have a child come from my body, but the influence that I hope to have over 
young women, black girls, white girls, whatever, whatever your magic is, you know, if I can have a little piece of my career influence it, that may have been the gift that I was meant to receive in exchange. And I think that's the thing, right? Figuring out what the path is for us. And I think so many of us figure that out early. Yeah. And then many of us figure that out later. I, or I stumble into it. <laughs> I, I'm convinced nothing is figured out, by the way. I, I, I don't think there's, I don't believe in closure. I think that's overrated. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I don't think, we're like, oh, I want closure from this breakup. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, until you see him with somebody like, I thought it was closed. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I don't believe in closure and I don't believe in plans because I just think that, again, a lot of what's happened in our lives, this is what I, I buy into, being ready for it. I think that if the door in my career has been open this much, I've been willing to kick it wide open mm -hmm. and not knock the door into someone. You know, I'm, not, I'm ambitious but not blind with ambition. So I wasn't willing to kick the door open so it would hurt someone, but I was willing to kick the door open. So I think that less planning and being prepared for when that moment comes, mm -hmm. are you going to show up? Are you ready? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I, you know, the little bit of life that I've lived, I think that's what I've learned over planning. So I've heard a lot of people say that they don't believe in luck, right? It's when preparation meets opportunity. Do you kind of believe in I believe in, in it because, okay, look, you can't control your parents. You can't control who you're born to or who adopts you or whatever. Um, geography, mm -hmm. where you're born. I mean, depending on where you're born in this country, you could be born where a high rate of infant mortality still exists. Education is, you know, at the lowest level in this country, and we're struggling, you know, coast to coast with getting our numbers up. Imagine being at the bottom of the totem pole in the United States, and you're born in a county in Mississippi that doesn't score as well. Mm -hmm. You had no control of that in the fifth grade, and that sets the tone because then, ultimately, you may be competing against a kid from Manhattan whose parents were able to pay $40,000 a year, and not to begrudge that, I mean, that's geography, that's where you were born and who you were born to. So I don't believe that we can dismiss these unknown variables, whether you are religious or not. You cannot control those factors. I was born to a single mom. Well, my mother and my father married, but divorced very soon. Um, my grandfather had a second grade education. I've told this story many times. Luling, Texas, we didn't have paved streets until the 80s. My grandfather's mother forced him into uh, farm labor because he needed to take care of the family, and that's what would happen then. But ultimately, a man with a second grade education, a woman who was divorced or separated by the time she was 22, they are the fabric of why I'm here now. So is it luck? I don't know. I mean, I was born to what some people might say, hard luck. Mm -hmm. Well, that hard luck turned into what I sure see as good luck. So I, I, I don't know how to process it, but to just chuck it up all to hard work, it's just not true because you can't control some of these variables. Tell us a little bit about your entry point into journalism. Mm. You know, I think about the time as a young African-American woman from Texas who believed. Mm -hmm. What was that moment for you and what propelled you to take that next step? Well, I was always raised in an environment where I was surrounded by strong women, mm -hmm. really, really strong women. And I had a grandfather and ultimately my stepfather, the dad that God meant for me to have. Um, they were just really salt of the earth people who never let me believe that winning wasn't an option. You know, it was like, oh, you're going to win. You know, I ran track. My dad was like, you're going to win this race. You know, I decided I wanted to play the clarinet. My dad's like, you're going to be first chair. I'm like, I'm first chair, Dad. You know, and so they were very, but they didn't do it in this um, dragon mom. You remember that book? And it was so controversial. It wasn't like that. It was more to build my self-esteem. Um, you know, when I got into TV, it was one of these things where I always knew that I was going to be a journalist. I didn't know what capacity. I remember trying to get a job at the Wall Street Journal right out of college, and I don't even, they, they were like, get out of here. And then I was on TV like in three weeks. I was like, what? <laughs> How'd that happen? I got my first TV offer, uh, actually before graduating college, Raleigh Durham. Um, but my dad said I had to finish school, that I could not take the job until I graduated. And I'm like, dad, the whole point of college is to get a job. <laughs> I got a job. He's like, but you need a degree. He's a backup. I'm like, yeah. So, um, I ended up getting my first job like straight away out of college, but it was after sending a ton of resumes and blind calls and ultimately luck, mm -hmm. as it was, as we call it, 
Um, I went to a TV station in Bryan College Station, and this kid who was a reporter, young white male, he had done something racially insensitive, and he was uh, being terminated. And uh, I got the spot. Um, some might say they were under pressure to hire a person of color and a woman after this debacle. I, I can't answer that. I know I rose to the occasion, mm -hmm. and I know I worked my butt off, and I ultimately ended up in Dallas. But I'll tell you this funny story. I got my job in Dallas. Um, again, a crazy story for another day that is just straight up, like it'll be in my book. But I get this job, and I walk in, and I see an African-American woman, one reporter. And we kind of look at each other. And we knew it was going down. <laughs> she was going to be out, and I was likely going to be in. Oh, I was wow. there for her. I didn't know I was there for a job. But when I started out, it was a woman for a woman, a black for a black. It, that's just how it was. Mm. Fast forward four years later, I walk into this newsroom. I see her. It's going down. And I replaced her again. No. I replaced the same woman two times in a span of four years. Um, at two different networks. One, there was a white male news director. The other was um, two women. Um, and I don't think they saw it mm -hmm. as a poker chip, but it was just like these slots were available. You know, they were, they were quota spots, if I can say that. Mm -hmm. She was an incredibly talented reporter. I think I'm pretty solid at what I do, but sometimes People see it as a numbers game, mm -hmm. diversity as a numbers game, which is unfortunate because I believe she was better than the A1 reporter who was a white male. And I'll, if I can say, I think I was better than him too. Mm -hmm. But we were interchangeable. So if we could pivot for a moment, mm -hmm. um, I think that, well, we all just saw the new episode coming out, right? It's insane, we right? We agree it's insane. It's it was insane. really good. Um, and I know I was on the edge of my seat. It's crazy. And I think about the way in your career you like kind of leaned in. And you could see in each episode, I certainly saw in that one, would you guys agree that um, not only is she always prepared, well-researched, and all of those things that journalists who are great at their job do, but she cares. Like what I, That's what really was conveyed I think most me. people. You know what I think most people do? I mean, we were in the green room for a second and you're interested. I think most of us, no matter what we do, you have to have some caring about it and hopefully a lot of it for it to work out. But I think, you know, look, my home state of Texas right now, you're seeing what's happening in Houston. And we've seen natural disasters around the world and man-made disasters. And think about how that impacts you, complete strangers, and you see a mom carrying their baby in waist-deep water. How do you not feel something? I think most people, I actually think, society and the generalization of us being indifferent people. It's just a bunch of crap that's sold to us. I don't think we are as divisive as people make us. I think our journeys give us a certain perspective. And in the wrong hands, it can cause us to turn on one another. But just because we are you know, pro bringing more women into the tech world does not mean we are saying remove more men out of it in exchange. And I think but when people prey on these concerns and differences, that's when the stereotype of us being selfish or indifferent. Mm -hmm. But with the crime show, you know, going back to that, it's impossible to sit across from a mom who has lost her son, they don't know where his body is, and she just needs that peace and not feel that. It's, it's like there was a movie, uh, I think Denzel Washington, where the person would touch you and what they were feeling. With the Deadline Crime Show, it doesn't even require a touch. I mean, there have been people, I walk in, and as soon as I see their face, I just lose it. Because you, that pain, it's just, it's, I, one of the things, real quick, that show did for me, um, it gave me the freedom to cry on camera. Because when I first started, you know, journalists don't cry. And I remember being in Waco, Texas. It had to be late 90s, horrible, horrible tornado, flat in this town right outside of Waco. And this little baby was killed. And I remember having to like interview someone in the neighborhood and keep it together. And I'm like, there's a baby that you know, like died in the storm. And everything is gone that these people possess. And a required of my, of my job is that I'm supposed to stay stone-faced? Mm -hmm. That's crazy to me. But I carried that rule in my head. And I started doing deadline crime. And so you're much, you're, you're doing it more frequently, meaning talking to people who've lost loved ones, and it's at a more intimate 
you know, kind of environment. It's just the two of you and maybe some camera people. And I just, I, I thought I was going crazy by the second season. I was going home, I was drinking. I'm like, I would binge eat because I was holding it all in. And when I finally started crying with them and, and not making them cry, crying with mm. them, I felt, not the words better, more comforting, you know, for my soul because I knew I'd had a human connection with someone who'd lost a loved one mm -hmm. rather than a reporter connection. You said something in the opening um, that struck me at the core when you said um, you not only want to uncover how these things happen, but why they happen. Yeah. Is that like the... Some of it is because like, okay, oh, second season, I did a story, this guy, he was married to this woman. He was a video game um, junkie and he played where you could, you know, connect with someone from somewhere else. He meets another guy and says, hey, visit me in Virginia. Well, let's be friends. Okay, that works where you find. The guy comes and he's like, kill my wife with me. <laughs> And the guy says, okay. And I'm like, what? How? You? So I, I'm fascinated by people who can convince other people kill. to kill someone they don't even know. I'm like, she didn't do anything. And the guy does it. I mean, one of the reasons also I did the show wasn't for us to look at someone else's life and go, oh, that's messed up. It's um, a situation where, in a lot of these cases, it could be any of us. Mm -hmm. And they're not that far-fetched, you know, where you, the parking lot situation, as women, as men, whatever, or robbery goes bad, and you happen to be, as in one of the cases this season, this guy was an aspiring rapper, you know, good kid, hanging out, and he and his buddy are in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they get gunned down. Mm -hmm. And it, it caused his mother to, you know, fight for justice, and ultimately she becomes an amazing politician in Florida. He was in just in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. Wow. Talk to us a bit about um, pop culture today mm -hmm. and the influence of it. I think yeah. about Tyler Perry yeah. lending his voice to the yeah. episode and to the cause, more yeah. importantly, and and uh, Reverend Sharpton, who we work with here at Google yeah. quite often. You know, do you think that that the, their ability to amplify that story and to help give it a pat, mm -hmm. platform of deadline crime. Like, have, how have you seen that move the needle to I certain think, causes? You know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this episode, the premiere, um, because of Tyler's involvement, not just from a monetary standpoint, but his voice. I mean, he, uh, one of the magazines, entertainment magazines, called him the most powerful man in Hollywood. Um, he basically um, turned Atlanta into a southern movie mecca with his studio and his influence. So that's his influence he's had in the film world and that he's willing to translate that in some way. And Tyler, he was watching TV and saw this story and was just outraged and called the local you know, television station. And can you imagine being the reporter? like, hi, it's Tyler Perry on the phone. <laughs> no, yeah, it's me. What is going on with this story? And he was moved in a way that if you know any of us had called, maybe I call. Of course, I'm a journalist, but some of you called. They'd be like, "Oh yeah, this is the local news, and we did the story by you know." But um, his voice is important. Um, I, I often shrug off when people, whether it's politics or in this case, deadline crime or the issue of domestic violence. I think celebrity voices are needed, mm -hmm. and I'm always sometimes mystified when people say, oh, you're a celebrity, shut up, you have no, I'm like, no, they're still a human being, mm -hmm. and if your megaphone is big and you can spread the word about something, why wouldn't we celebrate that? I get, there are always going to be people who go too far. I mean, there's somebody in the office right now, I'm sure you're like, she just <laughs> needs to shut up, just take it <laughs> too far, given this idea, but for the most part, you know, whatever size your megaphone is, it's needed. And that's why with domestic violence, you know, when we started the fund in honor of my sister, you know, most of those donations were people who followed me on social media, who followed my career, and they were like $5 donations. They were just people who wanted to use their megaphone mm -hmm. to spread the word, to shine a light, which is a part of the campaign mm -hmm. um, that I participated in, and we won an Edward R. Murrow Award for it. But, you know, I think, that this notion that any voice, whether it's George Clooney mm -hmm. or George Smith in South Oak Cliff, Texas, I mean, your voice matters. And I don't like this idea of shushing someone because of whatever reason. So I think for us, um, you know, you've shared, you shared actually in the episode and in the opening a lot about your personal journey mm -hmm. and, and story, especially with domestic violence. Um, can you share with us 
as you do this work, whether it's your philanthropy or through the work with Deadline Crime, is it emotionally taxing for you at times? And how do you practice self-care? I think all of us have yeah. you know, that thing that we deal with. So just mm -hmm. curious to know, as you do the work and you immerse yourself, like how do you mm -hmm. protect your spirit in the process? Well, I, I try to be healthy. I mean, like I said before, I was like putting like a bottle of wine and like I was like, <laughs> I go to the steak place. I'm like, I'll have the steak, the whole thing, the 18 ounce, <laughs> give me that, big baked potato, uh, yeah, the chocolate souffle, I'll take that too. And I, get, and I was like, because you're just, you're, trying to fill that, that mm -hmm. something that's painful inside you. Um, I, am, I love cooking, believe me, even though I live in New York in the heart of the city, I love cooking. Mm -hmm. And so I often will have dinner parties now with my friends over. I'm the queen of Blue Apron now. I make <laughs> yes. a mean Blue Apron. And so <laughs> I have Blue Apron weekdays and then we have food and wine uh, Saturday and Sundays where I peruse the food and wine magazine and I get a recipe. I practice, I fail, I poison, <laughs> I feed, it depends. Um, but I, I enjoy that. I'm very close to my family, my mother, as I reveal, my father passed away after my sister's uh, murder. And uh, so we're a very close family. We've always been. But I have three nieces and a nephew. So I just, I surround myself with great friends. I had a, a, flight, a fight party this Sunday or Saturday. Uh, and I had, you know, 15 of my close friends over from all walks of life. I could, truly a motley crew. It's like, I'm like, I feel like Noah bringing two of everything together. It's like my friends are so different. But... Um, yeah, I decompress with friendship. It's, it is, it's critical for me to laugh. I, I like surrounding myself with people who don't take themselves seriously, and we just yuck it up. But my friendships feed my soul. What about social media? I try not to use the word hate. This is what I dislike, and I think the curve correction will come. And one of those pivotal moments for me, uh, there was a Miss Universe contestant, and she was uh, Muslim. And this was some years ago. And a couple of people go on social media, and they say, awful things. Mm -hmm. And I remember I ended up on the show that I was on at the time doing a whole story on the five losers who'd said something <laughs> about her, not the other people who, you know, celebrate. And so I think these small groups of people are able to dominate the trolls. The troll. And so we end up going, well, here's what the troll said about <laughs> Katy Perry today. And I'm like, Katy Perry, I don't care. She had 90 million people following her. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm like, so if there are 330 million people in the United States, I don't know the numbers that are on Twitter or whatever, but the percentage, mm -hmm. we don't look at the, the ratio of mean comments. And so now shows like um, the one I did and some others will then um, uh, put the tweet in an article or put it up on air. So now bud, bud, dot, dot is now famous because his tweet is shown on a morning show. And I don't even know if he's real. I have no idea who you are. So I think the anonymity is a problem, but it also protects our voice. But there seems to be no verification of some of these mean things. And when you think about the impact that we allow these words to have, we call them trolls, but we still let them in. Mm -hmm. And proportionately, when you look at the comments, and then when people say, oh, it's trending on Twitter, or here's what people are saying on, Instagram, we pull out the three meanest things mm -hmm. and make these people the star of the show. It's strange. It is. Uh, but I, I do it. Listen, I can get <laughs> 17,000 great comments, and it's the one who goes, your lipstick was terrible. I'm like, really? What? My lipstick is off. <laughs> you know, it's like, and it sticks in your mind, then I throw the lipstick out three days later, and it seeps in. I'm like, ah. We all do it. The negative sometimes attracts us far easier than the light, and we have to reverse that if we're going to continue to have these social media platforms be productive. We cannot, and myself included, give in so easily to these minority of voices. What was the aha moment for you when you knew you were on the right track? Ha, think, I'm still waiting on it. <laughs> I don't I know. I think professionally, all of us have those moments where we wonder, like, are we really following our passion? Yeah. Are we really doing the right thing? Are we living in purpose oh. and on purpose? Was yeah. there a moment for you when you knew that this was right for you? This was the only option for me. I was either going to do this or deal cards in Vegas, and I don't know how to play cards, and I'm horrible at counting. <laughs> this was it. This was going back to, and I'm thinking a lot about what you said about luck. I did not know I would be on television. Mm -hmm. I knew that I would be in this field uh, that allowed me to interact, to capture stories about people. I've always enjoyed, as much as I like to talk, I do love hearing 
about other people and feeling their texture of life. And maybe it is because of how I was raised. And, you know, even um, there was a show many years ago. Um, I was watching it just talking about, of course, who we are as people. I don't know. I was like, I don't know, maybe 10 years old when I saw it. And it's just we have these shells and they become our armor mm -hmm. and they become our defense unit. But then when you peel them back on anyone, you find these interesting people. That's why I don't believe that most people are bad. I do not. Do I believe there are some really evil people? Yes. Are they a small group? Yes. Um, but just the idea of learning that there's so much more. Mm -hmm. I mean, even like everyone knows, it's no secret I love fashion. Yes. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Uh, <laughs> but then, you know, I've had people go, oh, well, Christian Louboutins. I'm like, you don't know anything about me. Mm -hmm. First of all, I've worked my entire life since I was 14. I've at one point in time had five shows on. And if your total sum of me is a pair of shoes that I can't even spell the name of either, mm -hmm. then I feel sorry for you that you choose to ignore my entire life scope. And I don't say that I grew up you know, poor as a badge of honor. That's just my life. Mm -hmm. And we're all the same way. And we've all been in situations where people make that one thing the total sum of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so for me, knowing that that one experience, that one thing that I see is not the total sum of that people, person or the story is why I'm a journalist. And I've always been like that. I've always been curious. I mean, I had a midwife named Mama Susie and um, she was like 100 when I was four, and she was still alive when I was in my 20s. I was like, what are you drinking? <laughs> but I, I preferred her company, Mama Susie's company, over kids my age, because I would just sit there and just talk to her and listen to her. It was incredible. And I, I can tell you exactly, if I close my eyes, where I would sit in her house that's since been leveled when I was seven years old. Mm. I can hear the screech of her back. She had one of those old school screen doors that wouldn't. I can hear the door. Mm -hmm. Is it just those are the things that matter to me? So we're going to turn it over to you guys for questions in a moment. So if you'll just line up at the microphones, please. Don't push questions. anybody down, okay? Let's keep this <laughs> civilized, okay? But we really want to hear from you. Um, so please uh, join us at the microphones. Uh, but, but I will um, ask you, uh, as my last question, for you to share with us a little bit more about Safe Horizon. Yes. The fund that you have with them called the Tamron Hart Renata Fund. Yes, yes. Um, Safe Horizon, I, I, I met um, counselors and workers of Safe Horizon about five years ago. They asked me to come and speak for their um, convention. It was in Harlem. And uh, their program just really resonated with me. And I think we've, we talk so much about the services and we forget about the people who are preparing the, for battle. I mean, these are people who have to go into homes and help women, in most cases, mothers, mm -hmm. in most cases, flee at the most dangerous time in their life, one in four women, victim of domestic violence, one in seven men. And people forget that someone has to go to that home in many cases and help that woman leave. So I really became connected with the stories of the workers. Um, the, these are the warriors on the front lines, the people who imagine, you know, you picking up a call five, six times a day as the hotline and someone is begging for help for their life, mm. not for some you know, whatever superficial thing, your life. Mm -hmm. And you're having, as the worker, to pick up that phone. So I teamed up with them, um, with my family over at the door PR. We came up with a plan um, to launch this fund. And they also have the Put the Nail in It campaign where you paint your um, ring finger on your left hand, which I have these long cat lady Beyonce nails this week. I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> I love them. But uh, paint it purple. And uh, it's in support. So whether it's being able to paint your nail, and we've had men do it, kids do it, uh, in support or give a donation. But the fun is to help um, families like mine who did not know how to handle it. We knew my sister was in a domestic violence relationship, and she had been in others. Um, but we had this thing of, you know, stick our head in the sand, kind of mind our business, protect her if she asked us. But if she didn't, we didn't do anything, and ultimately it resulted in a lot of regret and pain within my own family. And I started to talk to other friends of people and family members who also said they didn't know what to do. And survivors will also say, I don't want to bring my friends and my family in my mess. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to build a, um, an avenue for people to be able to get some advice if you think your friend is in a situation or loved one. And so you can say, what can I do? How do I bring this up? How can I help 
her or him, you know, get out of this situation without looking as if I'm judging or I'm condemning. Because sometimes if the victim feels like, you know, everyone's judging, they just retreat back to the abuser. Mm -hmm. So how do we approach it? And that was through my own pain of feeling that I had um, not done enough for my sister. But to be honest, I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to, you know, give as much support across the, the platform for families and survivors of domestic violence. I know we as Googlers like to give, so where can we go to support the fund? Uh, safehorizon.org. You'll see on the front page the Tamron Hart Renata Fund. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to paint your finger purple, that's awesome for the month of October. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it'll be great support, and, and I appreciate it. And even if you just, it just sparks a conversation. Now, I spoke at the NFL headquarters not terribly long ago, and several women shared with me, you know, either they were in a situation or... They had had friends, and they didn't quite know what to say. And you see this controlling behavior, but you don't want to be that friend mm -hmm. who's hating, as they might say, on someone's boyfriend. But you want to be supportive. So we had some very candid conversations, and I would encourage amongst yourselves, you know, with your friends, have those candid conversations. And if you need help, you know, you can reach out to me. DM me. Seems like every other crazy person does. I'd rather DM. <laughs> Slide in my DMs. <laughs> Slide in. It goes down in the DM. Uh, but being able to reach out, I, it does. Trust me. <laughs> it's insane. But, um, but, of course, I would always be available to, to offer advice at any given time. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Hi, Tamron. My name is Jenna Levy. I'm a recruiter here at Google. And I actually met you very, very briefly, probably about three years ago. I used to work at Discovery Communications. Oh. I met you at the Discovery Upfronts. I was very impressed with you and have followed your career since Thank and um, watched you on the Today Show. Wow. I watch a lot of Investigation Discovery, Thanks. Discovery Communications. <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to know, you mentioned some stories from your career that really stood out to you as either painful or mm -hmm. really impactful and kind of how you've dealt with um, Kind of the stress and, and, and some of the, the stories that you've kind of seen. I wanted to know if there was a particularly exciting or happy memory that you've had um, from, from your years of journalism that you Oh my God, they're countless. I mean, listen, I, I, I would love to say the one that sticks out. Oh, well, you know, listen, I've done morning TV for 30 years, so a lot of silliness. I mean, once um, Don King was, <laughs> oh, Don King was uh, promoting a match two box out there. They were like two big guys that looked like the guy from Rocky, you know, when he fought the Russian. These two big guys. Um, and I had, I walked out. They were in the studio live. And I walked out with a Don King wig on <laughs> with the real Don King across from me. And I'm like, you're going down, King? Only in America. <laughs> He was not entertained by it. <laughs> and I kept going, all in America. And <laughs> these flags. And I had on a green and white Diane von Furstenberg wrap dress. And it was real Don King. I kept going, oh, all in his face. <laughs> I thought he would appreciate that he's kind of out there. You know, he wasn't like an American glitter flag jack. And I'm like, you're not taking it that seriously. And then the piece that is his thoughts. I made him play Rock'em Sock'em Robot with me while I had a Don King wig on. Highlight of my career. <laughs> oh, God, I can't believe I confessed to that. It's on tape somewhere. It's, oh, and I made Christmas cards out of my picture with Don King. Oh, <laughs> that was my oh, holiday God. card. Oh, God. Hi. Hi, Tim. I don't know how I can top that. Uh, <laughs> first of all, thank you for not only being here, but for everything that you've done throughout your career. You really have been an inspiration. And throughout your career, you've and through the shows that you've been on, you've done a wonderful job of giving voice to the voiceless mm -hmm. and keeping stories that need to be told out there. Um, my question for you is, as a journalist, we see so many important things and stories coming out day after day. Mm -hmm. And with the nature of the news cycle, it gets faster and faster mm -hmm. and faster. As a journalist, what do you think we need to do to keep some of these important stories out mm -hmm. there and the stories that need to be told uh, making sure that they are told because so much they say is controlled by the trolls or controlled yeah. by what is just the the new story of the right. day but there's important stories that really need to be expounded right. upon and really need to be told you know I have to be honest with you I, I'm in conflict with myself as I have asked myself that very question of what's I mean listen ratings equal money so that means that the media has been monetized. Anything that can be monetized can be corrupted. It can be influenced. It can be a lot of things. Is that, am I saying the media that I, it's corrupt? I'm not saying that. I am though saying it can definitely be clouded. And so when I look at the media with that same skepticism, I have to also look at 
us as viewers. I'll give you an example. When the Boku Haram, the girls were missing, everyone was like on my social media, you guys aren't doing this story. You suck. Nah, nah, nah. We do it every day. I had the only reporter who was on the ground, she was an AP global reporter, um, come phoning in every day. Every time we did it, the number would dip. Mm. Every time. Now one might say they didn't like Deborah, all they did, I don't know, but I know every time we did that story. And the social media traffic was heavier than it seemed the TV interest. And so suddenly, if you notice, everyone stopped kind of doing the story, because I think they saw the same result. So I'm, 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 I'm able to look at my profession with a critical eye, myself included in that. But we as viewers have to look at ourselves. We get on our soapboxes and we'll be like, oh yes, I care about na na na. And then you look at the ratings of that compared to Love and Hip Hop LA, which I'm not hating, I love it. And it's sometimes it'll do higher rating than these things we care about. But here's what I think is empowering. TV is a la carte now. You know, my nephew, when I'm like, you don't have cable? He's like, cable? Who has cable anymore? I say that as my life is made on cable. But with our social media, we can pick and choose what we read. And we know that these clicks are monitored. You know this better than I do. And I think that we don't have to wait on Tamron Hall to report it. We can seek out the information. So I don't have the answer, to be honest with you. I'm as clouded. You know, I, I, I get so mad sometimes, you know, the headline will say something, you click the story, and you're like, I've been played. I do think people are getting sick of being played by clickbait. I think they are sick of these inflammatory and incendiary headlines on all sides. And I don't normally like to say on all sides because it's not always all. Some things are not equal. Mm -hmm. Let me be clear about that. But I think that we get clickbaited into these things, and then you don't know truth from reality anymore. So I don't know. I think we're just at a very interesting um, point in media consumption, but also as viewers. Because I, I see it firsthand. People will just yell at us for not covering stories. And then we would do the story, and the response from the viewer would be low. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I, it's something that I think we all should think about. But we have more power, even though there are more choices. We have more power in what we choose to consume. Google. You can pick and find out what you want. So I don't know. It's an, I wish I had the answer. But it is something. It's a great question, and I struggle with it a lot. Thank you Thank so you. much. Hi, Tamron. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, as a journalist, you have to ask some really tough questions that make everyone involved uncomfortable sometimes, even myself watching. Mm -hmm. What's your advice on the best way to do that without coming across mm -hmm. in a poor manner? I yeah. think that interestingly translates to a lot of our careers in mm -hmm. a different way, so that would be great to just hear your thoughts on that. You know, I had a friend many years ago give me, a, I don't know, I'm sure, because he wasn't the wisest of creatures, but I think he stole this idea from someone. He said, you have two pizzas at the same pizza place. Pick your favorite pizza place, whatever you love. Someone brings it fresh and hot in a pizza box, nice, lovely, whatever. Same pizza, fresh and hot, same company on a garbage pail. Which one are you going to eat? They're the same pizza. Both are clean, but one's on top of a garbage pail, one's inside a nice box. You're going to go for the nice box. You can ask someone anything, and I believe that. It's how you approach them. And I do fight sometimes, especially in the political world. I mean, there are a couple of videos out there that I would love to delete that were cheered on by people, but internally, the Scott Bayo thing still bugs me. That moment, I let me become a distraction from that topic. Um, rather than just handling it slightly. I wouldn't do it again. I, I wouldn't change how I handled Scott Bayo. But did I leave there going, yeah? No. Were other people like, yeah? <laughs> like My feelings weren't matching the moment. I think you can ask and present something in the most uncomfortable settings. It's just how you do it. I'll give you a funny lighter note on this. Ben Affleck, that movie Geely, I was in local news, and he was doing these junkets where they can't see you, but you can see them, and you're interviewing. And there's people say, you can't ask Ben Affleck about Jennifer Lopez. You cannot. He will not answer the question, blah, blah, blah. And I'm a huge Ben Affleck fan. And so I said, hey, Ben, um, I paid to see Geely. So you kind of owe me to be able to answer what I want to ask. And he started laughing. And it's just how you approach it, but more I did an interview with 
Winnie Mandela, which remains one of the most difficult interviews I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. And it was after her controversies and a lot of, you know, tough things were coming out about her. And um, it was hard because I've always admired Winnie Mandela. And I knew that there were allegations that were very serious, that it resulted in the deaths of some people, not by her hands, but it's all very complicated. Nevertheless, here I am across from one of my heroes, and I'm having to ask her these very tough questions, but that's my job. And that's why it's also wise, you know, not to view people as heroes. You know what I mean? We can learn something from everyone. I caution against, you know, putting people on this pedestal of being a hero. So to answer, you know what, sometimes you just gotta, gotta hit it. You know, you gotta ask that question, whether it's in work, if it's about, you know, they say women, we have a hard time asking for raises or are due. I've been there. I've been there where you kind of like laugh and try to have the humor and diffuse it. And oh, well, I, 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 I've been there. Um, and I've been in other situations where I've said, this is what I'm doing. And today is the day I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And so that it's life. But I think you can approach anything. I try because I'm a naturally, I think I like to be funny and I like laughter. My thing is I try not to deflect to humor because it's uncomfortable. I try to stay polite, straight up, direct. And I think that you can ask any question. There's not one that I'm unwilling to ask someone if it's A, based in fact. <laughs> and you know, your, you know your intentions. Any other questions? All right. If not, uh, let's give it up for Tamron Hall. <laughs> Be sure to check out Deadline Crime with Tamron Hall this Sunday yes, on Investigation it. Discovery. Uh, I know I'll be tuning in, so make sure that you do too. Thank you. And also a special thanks to our Talks at Google team and Black Googler Network for making today's program happen. So let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Where can we follow you on Instagram? Oh, uh, yes. Slide in your DMs. Oh, that's slide in. <laughs> oh, gosh. If I want to do a book just of DMs. That's what I want to do. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Please don't it'll be that. triple X. Um, <laughs> no, uh, Tamron Hall on Twitter, Tamron Hall on Instagram, Tamron Hall on Facebook. That's the joy of having an unusual name. We can yeah. own our domains other than the camera lens company. I'm the only Tamron <laughs> I know. But uh, yes, uh, absolutely. And always reach out. And I love hearing from you guys on social media. And it's been a joy to be here. I really appreciate it. It keeps these kinds of interactions do more for me than you can ever imagine, just to be able to be in a room and talk civilized about all kinds of things. It's, it's a joy, so I really am I'm grateful that you invited me. Thank you so much, Boo. Thank you so much. Thank you. You did a great job. Shout out. Thank you. Um, you have our support, and we yes. will be watching. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys.